Welcome to the second installment of the um, Exploring the Frontiers of Incompleteness project. It's uh, suitable to have Hugh Wooden and Solomon Pfefferman as our two speakers because they occupy two different extremes on the questions that concern us. Remember those questions are first, do the classically undecided statements have determinate truth values? In particular, does CH have determinate truth value? And if so, What's the answer? And last time, Wooden argued that they do have a determinate truth value, and he proposed new axioms which give the answers, in particular, axioms which prove CH. And today, Solomon Pfefferman is going to argue that they don't have determinate truth values. In particular, CH doesn't. And so the search for new axioms is questionable. OK, Solomon Pfefferman. Thanks, Peter. Um, so I really want to thank uh, Peter for organizing this very stimulating series. And um, it's a pleasure to be here again. Um, so this talk is based on a draft paper that um, uh, was solicited by the project, the EFI project, and uh, it's uh, online in the uh, EFI uh, materials, but it's also can be found on my own homepage. I want to start with a couple of quotations. Uh, first of all, from Gödel, very famous article of 1947, um, What is Cantor's Continuum Problem? He did a second uh, version of this paper, mostly the same, but uh, in 1964, uh, after Cohn's uh, forcing method uh, and independence results uh, were discovered. But the essence is the same. And he starts by uh, stating a form of Cantor's continuum problem that uh, he asks, how many points are there on a straight line in Euclidean space? Or equivalently, how many different sets of integers do there exist? Well, they're equivalent in the sense that they have the same cardinal number. Uh, taking the straight line to be given in Euclidean terms, uh, in Euclidean spaces given by the real number system. Um, so the question is, it's posed that way, it's a little ambiguous. Uh, it seems to me what he's asking there is, is the cardinality of the continuum, which uh, we can formulate in terms of cardinal arithmetic in two ways, first as 2 to the aleph 0, or uh, secondly in terms of one of the alephs, aleph 1 or aleph 2, and so on. So it seems to me uh, we have to interpret this question in the form, which aleph is this? Is it aleph 1? Is it aleph 2? And so on. That, that's the interpretation. We'll have another form of the question in just a moment. So he says the analysis of the phrase leads uh, unambiguously to a definite meaning for the question. So he's on the side where, uh, uh, yes, this has a definite meaning. Now here's the second form of the uh, uh, continuum question, and it's the form that I want to be using uh, throughout this talk, rather than the one, which aleph is it? Namely, um, take any subset of the continuum um, interpreted either as the real number set or as the set of all subsets of the natural numbers, uh, is that subset, um, ha does that subset have an intermediate cardinality between the natural numbers and all the real numbers? Or must it be one or the other? Uh, now he remarks that um, At the time of writing, 1947, he says it's about 60 years since uh, Cantor formulated uh, his questions about uh, cardinal and ordinal numbers, um, that uh, in fact it's one of the first very important problems for the subject, uh, but practically nothing has been proved so far uh, relative to the question what the power of the continuum is. 
whether its subsets satisfy the condition just stated, that is, whether they have a cardinality possibly in between that of the full continuum and cardinality of the natural numbers, uh, except that it's true for a certain infinitesimal fraction of these subsets, namely the analytic sets. We'll come back to that uh, later on, what the meaning of that is. And that we don't know any upper bound for the power of the continuum in the Alephs, uh, and we don't know whether it's regular, singular, accessible, inaccessible, and so on, except for Koenig's negative result, rather famous result, that the cofinality can't be omega, little omega, um, what its character of cofinality is. Now, I turn to a second uh, quotation, this one from uh, Tony Martin in a volume uh, edited by Felix Browder called The Hilbert Problems, Hilbert famous problems from 1900, the very first problem that he posed was the continuum problem. Uh, and uh, Martin reviewed uh, the state of uh, situation uh, concerning that problem uh, in 1976 when the uh, Browder volume was published. And he says that throughout this discussion, he's been assuming a naive and uncritical attitude towards CH, that is, taking it on its face value as a definite problem and saying that, in fact, it's my, his attitude. He doesn't want to dismiss the opposite viewpoint. And uh, that those who argue that the concept of set is not sufficiently clear to fix the truth value uh, of CH uh, have a, a position which is uh, uh, difficult to assail. And as, as long as no new axiom is found which decides CH, their case will continue to grow stronger, and our assertion that the meaning of CH is clear will sound more and more empty. I think that's a quotation that one should keep in mind throughout this series, uh, whether indeed uh, the situation uh, has changed in some uh, substantial way, or it's uh, much like what uh, Martin was reporting in 1976. So my own view is that, uh, in fact, it's not a definite problem. And uh, I use the words in the past. I, in fact, I, I call it essentially indefinite for reasons that uh, I'll explain. Uh, in the past, I've called it inherently vague. And that the reason for that is that the concepts of arbitrary set and function, which are used in its formulation, uh, even at the level of the totality of subsets of the natural numbers is essentially indefinite. And it, uh, the reasons for that, uh, my reasons, partly circumstantial evidence about uh, the development of the field of set theory in the last many, many years, um, but partly philosophical grounds, uh, basically anti-Platonistic and uh, in opposition to that, uh, what I call a humanly based uh, conception of what we're doing when we do mathematics. And what that is, is that we have more or less clear conceptions of mathematical structures. And I want to uh, explain some ideas about that later on in the talk. So um, other words that have been used uh, in describing the issue here uh, is uh, in an article by Peter in uh, 2010 uh, in uh, a volume uh, for, uh, of essays about Gödel. Um, title of the article are There Were Absolutely Undecidable Problems. Uh, Kellner himself argues that there's much evidence that, in fact, there are not. Uh, and in fact, that CH is, is, is not such a problem. But the characterization of absolute undecidability is an interesting one. It's that uh, it would be called absolutely undecidable if it's undecidable relative to any set of axioms that are justified. Now, I prefer not to use that terminology um, because it seems to me to presume the idea that the proposition in question, or the statement in question, has a definite mathematical meaning, but it's just we have no way of settling the truth value. 
because uh, it evades all uh, sets of axioms that are, that are justified. Now, to argue that CH is absolutely undecidable seems to me weaker than what I'm trying to argue, which is that it's essentially indefinite. But it seems to me that part of my critique uh, supports the absolute undecidability of CH, who do take it to be a definite statement. So I won't dispute that the continuum hypothesis, CH, is a definite statement in the log language of, uh, of set theory. Of course it is. Uh, whether you consider that language formally or informally, uh, it simply concerns the, set, the power set of the power set of N, that is, questions about the totality of subsets of the continuum, and there's no doubt that that language itself involves concepts that have become an established, uh, robust part of mathematical practice. So if you think of that as a seamless connection, uh, of course, uh, then it comes directly into actual mathematical practice. But in fact, mathematical practice, uh, other than uh, the practice of higher set theory, uses relatively little from these concepts and need not, so the robustness uh, is maybe uh, on one view part of the conception of what these things are, the double power set of N, but need not be necessary for what is actually used of set theory in mathematical practice. I'm going to look at this from uh, three directions. First of all, what I call a thought experiment uh, related to the millennium uh, problem, prize problems. Secondly, to elaborate these ideas about what I call conceptual structuralism. And third, um, I want to do a little bit on what I consider to be a logical framework in which one can begin to distinguish uh, definite from indefinite concepts and speak in more precise terms rather than philosophical terms about the question. So what is the Millennium Prize list? Um, it was um, designed for the year 2000 and came out in, in the year 2000. It uh, listed seven famous unsolved problems, uh, among the most famous uh, for mathematicians, of course, the Riemann hypothesis and the Poincaré conjecture. For computer scientists, the P versus NP problem, and so on. There's a nice article by uh, Arthur Jaffe in the Notices of the American Math Society in 2006 explaining the genesis of the prize list and uh, uh, how it was, what the Scientific Advisory Board uh, consisted in, who, who was on the board, and what their criteria were for uh, what, what uh, problems would go on the list. And the prize, very substantial, a million dollars for the solution of each prize. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, obviously the criteria for meeting the prize uh, would be very substantial uh, examination by the uh, mathematical community in, in, in various ways. But the criteria for including a problem on the list were uh, that the problem should be it's historic, should be central, important, difficult, relatively easy to state, and so on. So there were a series of things like that that you'll find in the uh, Jaffe article. Now, the continuum problem is not on the list. We don't know whether it was considered for inclusion on the list. Um, Jaffe writes in his article um, for people who ask, why wasn't my favorite problem on the list? They didn't want to answer that. They just wanted to say, the problems on the list meet the criteria that they set down. And they didn't want to get into arguments about <laughs> whether some other problem should have been or should not have been on the list. Um, at any rate, it's not on the list. But we have a new situation, which uh, mathematician, Russian mathematician Grigory Perlman actually solved the Poincaré conjecture. Everybody agrees that he solves it now, those who are uh, cognizant of the kind of mathematics that's involved. And uh, uh, not only did he solve it, but then he declined the prize. So that frees up a million dollars, it would seem to me, 
uh, that uh, the committee that uh, established this prize could say, well, we have this extra million dollars around, why not uh, consider adding a new problem to the list? And uh, so the thought uh, experiment that I'm going to be taking you through is uh, that they ask the mathematical community to suggest new problems to be added to the list. And one of them, obviously, uh, that ought to be considered is the continuum problem. So they call on an expert in set theory, EST. So the Scientific Advisory Board, SAB, is meeting with the uh, expert on set theory. And they ask the expert, why is this problem important? And what's been done to solve it? Well, set theory is the foundation of all mathematics, according to most people. And this, after all, is one of its most basic uns unsettled problems. And the cachet that Hilbert put on it, uh, of its being number one on Hilbert's list, ought, ought to count uh, also for the importance of this. And there was a lot of work on this. There was a long uh, series of efforts. Uh, an interesting article coming out in the Bulletin of, the, uh, the Bulletin of Symbolic Logic, uh, the last uh, issue this year, by Gregory Moore, who wrote uh, the volume on uh, Tormello's axiom of choice, tracing the uh, work on the continuum hypothesis and also the generalized continuum hypothesis. So you can see in that article uh, what the, those efforts are. Um, and it continued uh, along certain lines into the mid-30s, uh, most extensively by Sierpinski and uh, Luzin and, uh, and his school in, in Russia. And there's been lots of modern work, too. But there has been a pronounced shift following Gödel's proof of the consistency of the axiom of choice and the continuum hypothesis with the axioms of Tamerlo Frankel uh, to a metamathematical approach as opposed to a mathematical approach in the ordinary sense of the word. <clears throat> so uh, but they ask, well, Gödel says nothing was learned beyond uncountability of the continuum in Koenig's theorem, which says what its cofinality uh, can't be. And uh, the expert says, well, he didn't mention work Word on, uh, work on the perfect set problem, PSP, uh, <coughs> which simply says that uh, a set X has PSP if it contains a perfect subset, a non-empty perfect subset could contain trivial empty. Uh, and every perfect subset has to have the power of the continuum. So if, if a set has the PSP, then uh, it satisfies that condition that its cardinality uh, must be the full continuum. If it has no perfect subset, um, uh, then it's going to be countable. So um, in other words, if it's uncountable, it's, it's going to be the power of the continuum. So the best result, and that comes back to what uh, Gödel said about there's an infinitesimal fraction of sets which have that property, that's the PSP property, uh, is that the analytic sets, that is the projections of Borel sets, um, have the PSP. They asked whether uh, the complements of those sets, the co-analytic sets, have the PSP. And Gödel showed in his uh, announcement of his results about the consistency of uh, axiom choice and continuum hypothesis that, in fact, it's consistent to uh, assume uh, with those axioms that uh, there are uncountable co-analytic sets which don't have the PSP. And that's uh, true, that's the situation in his model uh, of the constructible sets. So uh, the board like to know, well, does that mean that it settles the PSP problem? And uh, no, it's pointed out, well, it could well be consistent too that all, all co uncountable co analytic sets and even all, all uncountable sets in the projective hierarchy, uh, which are obtained alternately by projection and complementation, starting with the Borel sets, 
first you, by projection, you get the analytic, then complementation, co-analytic, and you keep alternating these to go higher and higher in the projective hierarchy. <coughs> and the uh, set theorist says, in fact, it's been shown using protective determinacy that uh, all sets, uncountable sets in the projective hierarchy have the PSP property that is contain a, a, uh, a uh, perfect subset. And that's been shown using projective determinacy, PD, which is restriction of the so-called axiom determinacy, AD. Well, what are AD and PD? Very briefly, um, you associate with each subset of the continuum a, a two-person infinite game, alternating zeros and ones. I'm thinking of um, the set of all subsets, the power set of n here. Now you can think of it as 2 to the n, um, se infinite sequences of zeros and ones. So you choose, uh, think of this set as a subset of those infinite sequences of zeros and ones, alternately choosing zeros and one. Uh, player one wins if this, the run of that sequence is in the set G of X, and player two wins otherwise. And the axiom determinacy says that one or the other players has a winning strategy uh, in that game for X. And that was uh, proposed, uh, that was a, an axiom uh, it shouldn't have been called an axiom. It's, it's a, po a mathematical possibility that ought to be investigated, but it's come to be called an axiom, uh, introduced by Michelsky and Steinhaus in the early 1960s. And among other things, they proved that it contradicts the axiom of choice. And set theorists will not give up the axiom of choice because that's what we when we think of what set theory is supposed to be about, namely arbitrary sets independent of how they're defined, uh, um, the axiom of choice is a clear principle that we ought to accept. But we do like, we in the higher set theory community do like the axiom of determining, see, because it has so many nice properties among them. Uh, that uh, all sets are Lebesgue measurable, have the projective, uh, ha have the perfect subset property, and so on. Now, it turns out that projective determinacy, which says that every projective game, uh, game for associated with a set in the projective hierarchy, uh, is determined, um, <coughs> has um, one of the other players has a winning strategy that that has the same consequences, those nice consequences for sets in the projective hierarchy. And that was proved, uh, exceptional result, by uh, Martin and Steele in an article in 1989 whose, ti whose title is A Proof of Projective de of Determinacy. A Proof of Projective Determinacy. was published in the American Journal of Mathematics, I think. So the board is pretty impressed with this. It sounds like real progress. You're telling me not only is it consistent with the axiom of the set theory that uh, all projective sets have the PSP property, but uh, it's true. Although we know now by uh, what Gödel had done back in 1938 that it, it can't be true in the constructible set. Well. There's a qualification here. Yes, it's true. If there exist infinitely many wooden cardinals with a measurable cardinal above all of them, that's explicitly stated in the Martin and Steele paper. It's not that they're trying to say uh, something that uh, doesn't have this kind of qualification. Well, what are these things? What are uh, measure? What are uh, wooden cardinals? He knows. The advisory board says, well, we know what a measurable cardinal is. We know by Scott's result that that's not true in the constructibles. Uh, but what are wooden cardinals? And um, uh, the answer is, well, it has a pretty, pretty technical definition. Uh, they're among what are called the large, large cardinals. If you look in the book by Kanamori, The Higher Infinite, you can find a big chart of large, large cardinals, and you'll see that uh, they're 
sitting somewhere between measurable cardinals, uh, but not their uh, consequences are not as strong as those of uh, this assumption of super compact cardinals. <clears throat> so um, while Martin and Steele didn't mention the need of wooden cardinals in, in the title of their paper, she say in the, in the title of the paper, a proof of projective determinacy, um, and then in the paper itself you say, assuming such and such, are these things that are intuitively justified, intuitively clear, uh, that their existence should be uh, accepted. And now the uh, set theory expert goes into a long story, which I uh, only very briefly tried to uh, state here. I hope I'm not uh, misrepresenting the, the case. But the idea is that if you look at um, so-called natural theories extending uh, usual axioms of set theory, uh, not only a ZF, but of course the axiom of choice and, uh, and so on. Um, and not cooked up theories, theories that naturally come out to the development of set theory. There's an empirically observed phenomenon that um, these theories always can be compared even when they contradict each other as does uh, taking zermelo frankel with choice and adding either continuum hypothesis on one side or negation of the continuum hypothesis on the other, they're of equal strength. Uh, and you can go back and forth from one theory into the other by uh, in a, a certain kind of interpretation. But the simplest uh, relationship here is what's called the equiconsistency hierarchy uh, of natural theories. And it, surprisingly, that turns out to be linear. It's an empirically observed phenomenon that uh, these things uh, increase in linear strength rather than branching out in, in, in different ways, excuse me. Um, and that in establishing that things have the same uh, consistency strength or the same interpretability strength, central to um, the relationships are these large cardinal axioms. They play a crucial role in showing that uh, theories of uh, the same uh, consistency strength are indeed of, of the same consistency strength. So they're used to mediate between these. And that somehow the large cardinal axioms form a backbone to natural theories uh, extending, um, extending uh, the more familiar ones. Now, there are similar relationships involving the restricted versions of the axiom of determinacy, like projective determinacy or de determinacy for what's called uh, the constructibles relative to the real numbers. <coughs> so now, I'm not sure what the argument I is from that, but that there's some sort of inner harmony in these extensions that must be something real behind it, and that what's behind it keeps coming up are these large cardinal axioms or the ver restricted versions of the axiom determinacy. And so, I don't know, um, I mean, I think some people use the language, well, that shows these axioms are true, but uh, maybe just a weaker uh, uh, stance, namely, these axioms ought to be accepted. And they're justified by their crucial role within this uh, linear hierarchy. As I say, I'd, I may be misrepresenting the, the position, but that's it. Well, the advisory board looks at this and says, well, it doesn't sound very convincing to me. Why should I accept these large cardinal axioms which say that these super, super large cardinals exist? Now, that's just the story about things like projective determinacy, for which we needed uh, infinitely many wooden cardinals. 
But what about the original continuum problem? How about getting back to that? Well, this is an old result of Levy and Soliday back in, the, in, the, in 1967 that shows that uh, that statement is independent of all large cardinal axioms that have been considered, um, assuming they're consistent. Some have been considered, which in fact are inconsistent, Reinhardt's uh, proposed uh, axiom, for example. And we don't know, maybe lurking in that table that uh, in, the, uh, in the final part of uh, Kanamori's book, there are inconsistencies still up there. But what the Levy and Solovey result says it doesn't really matter. If they're consistent, then uh, CH is going to be independent. So large cardinal axioms will not decide the continuum hypothesis. You need something more. Well, what is that more? <clears throat> and uh, the answer is, well, some of the experts think that one of the most promising ways to go is what's called the strong omega conjecture, which, if true, implies that the power of the continuum is L of 2. But it would take much longer to explain what that is and how it works, and uh, I'm not going to try that either. I mean, that's so. Uh, we both get off the hook. Um, well, if I were sitting on the scientific advo advisory board as a mathematician, not as a logician, uh, this is what I'd say. I'd say, well, uh, thank you for <laughs> your advice and interesting information and so on, but uh, um, um, Basically, uh, take, take it as it is and go on to see what the next expert and the next subject has to say about it. So that's the thought experiment. Well, what's the thought involved in the thought experiment? Should the advisory board add the continuum hypothesis to the list? Uh, <clears throat> and it does seem, I think, that the usual idea of truth, as used by mathematicians, um, is no longer operative in these research programs. That we're in very speculative reach reaches of modern work on set theory. That there's, for the experts, compelling evidence to consider these kinds of principles the large cardinal axioms or restricted versions of the axiom of determinacy, uh, and to work with them and see what consequences they have and what interrelationships they have. But that this falls short for ordinary mathematicians of truth in the ordinary sense of the word. So I think that um, if, say, let's, let's continue the thought experiment. If, say, the continuum problem were put on this prize list, and if, say, Wooden established his strong omega conjecture, and the experts in the subject went over it and found that his proof was correct, would that get the mathematics community to say, Oh, yes, well, now we know that the cardinality of the continuum is L of 2. Uh, I don't know if uh, Wooden is still thinking that that conjecture is true, but that was not, no longer the. So I haven't heard the latest words on what this, but we're talking a few years ago. That's oh, what, yeah. yeah. I say, some, some might say, well, it's just like the axiom of choice. When the axiom of choice was proposed by Cermelo in 1904, uh, and then again, uh, more arguments that he gave in 1908, there was a tremendous amount of resistance to it by mathematicians. Why should we accept that? Um, asking 
how you would make these choices if you can't show how they could be defined, how they could be actually be uh, constructed. Uh, and there was long, long discussion of that, um, well into the 30s. <coughs> Of course, there are still people who won't accept the axiom of choice. But Sir Mello's argument, don't forget, the, the, look at the comparison here. The axiom of choice is one very simple statement. And the idea is, look at what it means to be talking about arbitrary sets. If we have uh, an arbitrary collection of arbitrary non-empty sets, then there's a set which has exactly one element in common with each of them. There's an intuitive picture there that you can point to. Not only that, Sermello pointed to, explained that if you look at various arguments that people have been making in analysis, the axiom of choice is used all over without people realizing that they were using it. There's nothing like that uh, for these large cardinal axioms uh, and um, uh, restricted versions of the axiom determinacy. It's my view that the likelihood of a proof which requires essential appeal to such axioms in order to demonstrate that TH is or is not true, that, that um, the likelihood of that being accepted by the mathematical community is practically nil. It's not comparable to the situation with the axiom of choice. Well, but that doesn't say that CH itself is or is not definite. That's simply that thought experiments puts, us, puts in question the relation of the work in the higher set theory community compared to ordinary mathematical work and the ordinary notions of truth in the mathematical community compared with uh, the working hypotheses of the uh, set theory community that we're talking about. So I believe we have to dig deeper into the philosophical uh, aspects of these questions, the philosophical presuppositions of set theory. <clears throat> and what are the options? Well, I'd say if you're not a total rejectionist, a finitist or a constructivist or predicativist, if you, if, if you think that set theory makes sense, um, to a considerable extent. Um, what are the grounds for talking about truth there? Well, philosophically speaking, one is the Platonistic or so-called realistic view, namely that sets, the universe of sets is independent of all human thoughts and constructions, and statements about that universe are therefore either uh, true or false. So we all know all the problems with Platonism, and in particular with Platonism and set theory. Uh, a good starting point is the article by Paul Benassarif um, <coughs> about that and the problems raised by Benassarif. Another view is what is a form of deflationism. I think John Burgess is one who's advanced this, namely, Deflationism in the theory of truth simply says uh, to say that something is true is simply to say the statement itself. So in set theory with classical logic, every statement or its negation is accepted, so therefore every statement is true or not true. Um, but that doesn't really get us anywhere. I don't think we're satisfied if we say, I want to know whether CH is true or not. Just telling me that, well, CH or not CH, therefore, <laughs> it's true or it's not true. That's my, not going to the issue that I expect we are going to. So while deflationism is uh, one reasonable theory of truth, I don't think it's helpful in this respect. Now, there are other um, views which are more on the methodological ground than uh, try to, uh, to have uh, um, a kind of philosophical underpinning for what you might call mathematics is as mathematics does, the autonomy of mathematics 
philosophy shouldn't explain, shouldn't tell mathematicians what they can or cannot do. Mathematicians know best what they can or cannot do. Um, and I think uh, when Penelope Matty was uh, doing uh, her, her work on naturalism in mathematics and uh, also, um, I'm sorry, I can't think of his name, the, the book on uh, the autonomy of mathematics. <coughs> Um, that's a kind of a philosophical underpinning for, for that point of view. Uh, more recently, uh, Maddie has stressed methodological uh, uh, themes. That is, what we're after is to maximize. So that tells us why we don't accept the axiom of constructibility, another statement that should not have been called an axiom. And finally, so there are many, many uh, philosophical directions one can move with respect to set theory. I'm just listing a few here. Uh, there are varieties of structuralism. <clears throat> of course, mathematics um, and modern mathematics especially has been dominated by uh, structuralist views throughout, uh, especially in the 20th century. But I think it's fair to say that mathematicians uh, have always implicitly been uh, Structuralists, they don't care what numbers really are. That's not the issue to them. It's how uh, they relate to each other. Um, so the kind of question that Frege raised, uh, what is the number two, for example? Is it equal to Julius Caesar or not? He had to know the answer to that, which was, for a mathematician, a ridiculous kind of question. <coughs> There are many uh, philosophers of who uh, uh, take a, a, um, a structuralist view to one extent or another. I list them here. Uh, some of them don't have any position on the continuum hypothesis. Some of them do. I think Shapiro uh, affirms that it has a definite value. Um, and uh, Isaacson does too, Dan Isaacson. He believes it um, has definite truth value, whereas Jeffrey Hellman, I think, agrees with me. And I don't know about the others. So I laid out uh, in the paper that's referred to in, in uh, the paper that I mentioned at the, at the beginning, and that's on my homepage too, what I think conceptual structuralism amounts to. And um, put it out in the form of 10 theses. And I'm not going to give all of those here, uh, but the ones that it seems to me are most relevant to what's at, what's at issue here. And that is that the basic objects of mathematical thought exist only as mental conceptions. Of course, the source of those conceptions lies in everyday experience in, in manifold ways. <clears throat> that there are certain kinds of relatively simple ideal world pictures, not of objects in isolation, but related to each other in a structural way, conceive, coherently conceived groups of objects that are interconnected by uh, few simple relations and operations. And we understand these, we uh, deal with these conceptions prior to any axiomatics or systematic logical development. Those follow the conceptions as they're initially uh, uh, understood and communicated. And that certain significant features of these structures come directly out of our uh, world pictures or our conceptions. Others may be less certain. So for example, in the case of geometry, where you're talking about, well, what are the objects we're dealing with? Infinitely fine points, infinitely perfect straight lines, infinitely flat, uh, perfectly flat plane. Um, and when you start going into refined questions about, such as about the parallel problem, or parallel hypothesis, it may be less clear what, uh, uh, what uh, we'd be willing to say. But certain things are obvious, uh, namely that uh, 
two lines either are parallel or they intersect in uh, exactly one point. And that mathematics needs little to get started, and once started, a bit, little bit goes a long way. So that's a favorite uh, quote of mine, that a little bit goes a long way in various parts of mathematics when we're talking about foundations as it applies to mathematics. Now, basic conceptions differ in their degree of clarity. And one may speak of what is true in a given conception, but that notion of truth may only be partial. Truth in full is applicable only to completely clear conceptions. <clears throat> Obviously, we're broaching here on issues of subjectivity and differences and what's clear to different people or pe the same people at different stages. Now, when these kinds of conceptions are communicated, it's assumed that the people we're communicating with have a certain level of sophistication and a certain receptivity to these kinds of ideas that allows them uh, to deal with to grasp the ideas at issue and to see what's true or what's not true in the conceptions. Now I jump to a rather long thesis. I should have broken it up and that would have made 11 theses, but that didn't seem as nice, so uh, here it is. The objectivity of mathematics lies in its stability and coherence under repeated communication, critical scrutiny, expansion by many individuals often working independently of each other. That incoherent concepts are ones which fail to withstand that kind of critical examination or lead to conflicting conclusions are eventually filtered out from mathematics. That's an historical statement. Uh, but the objectivity of mathematics as practice is a special case of what we might call intersubjectivity, ob intersubjective objectivity, and that's uh, ubiquitous in social reality. Well, what is social reality? Uh, one of the people who's written about this is John Searle, but there are a number, number of uh, thinkers who've, who've talked about ideas of social reality. Uh, Searle always formulates things very clearly and pungently, so uh, I'm quoting from him only. Um, here it is. There are portions of the real world, objective facts in the world, that are only facts by human agreement. In a sense, there are things that exist only because we believe them to exist. Money, property, governments, marriages. Many facts regarding these things are objective facts in the sense they are not a matter of our preferences, evaluations, or moral attitudes. Here's some examples. They're similar to the ones that Searle himself used. They're examples about me. Objective facts about me, that I'm a citizen in the United States, I voted in every U.S. presidential election so far since I became eligible by age to do that. I have a Ph.D. in mathematics from the University of California. My wife and I own our own home in Stanford, and the peculiarity of that uh, owning a home at Stanford is that the land on which it sits is owned by the university. It's only leased to us. Uh, that's an objective fact. We can sell our house, but we can't sell our land. Uh, going over to games, we know what's happened. Uh, and if you know, follow tennis. Uh, the rules of tennis are very definite. Whether in a given tennis match, uh, there's a conflict about whether something meets the rules or not. Of course, that's where the, what the referee is there for. There's a vagueness in practice, but uh, there's no question that Rafael Nadal lost the U.S. Tennis Open in 2011 after having won it in 2010. The game of chess, again, um, in an actual physical game of chess, there may be a conflict about whether, in fact, one has made a given move or not. Uh, if uh, one has edged uh, a piece partially across a, a line, there might be an argument about that. But 
The idea of chess is a, ba is a, 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 is a socially objective conception that we can agree about and we can see it uh, when a game is list, all the moves have been listed, we can see uh, that all the rules have been met and we can see how the game has evolved and so on. And we can prove theorems about chess. We can prove that uh, uh, the, the, the statement here uh, is a theorem about chess. And it's not far removed from that to go over to mathematics say, well, it's true, there are infinitely many prime numbers. And we don't know whether it's true that there are infinitely many twin prime numbers. So I want to, my view is that the basic conceptions of mathematics are social constructions and that uh, the reality that we ascribe to mathematics is simply the result of intersubjective objectivity about those conceptions, not about a supposed independent reality uh, in any Platonistic sense. And point, it does not require, uh, we can talk about what's true in a given conception, but we need not require that everything in that conception is true or not true. It may simply be undecided. Now, uh, in fact, in the um, Constitution uh, of the United States, there's uh, a, uh, an amendment which uh, tells us what the line of succession is to the presidency. Should the president uh, die or uh, be incapacitated, who follows up, so on. In fact. Right now, there's a line 17 down, but after that, nothing is said. It could be that every one of those people is uh, dies or incapacitated, cannot assume the role of the presidency, and at that point, it would be undecided what to do next. But there's objective fact that certain people in certain um, scheme of what the government of the United States is are on this line of succession. And the people who fulfill those roles at different times, of course, varies, but the roles are definite. The president, the vice president, the speaker of the house, and so on and so forth. I guess I'm, uh, how much time do I have, uh, Peter? I need it. Another 15 minutes, is that okay? Okay. Um, so I'm not gonna, I usually go on about the natural numbers. I don't understand people who say that this is not a perfectly clear conception, but uh, I argue that it is. It's the most primitive mathematical conception that we have of the positive integer sequence, first of all. Later on, we add zero <coughs> for convenience of various kinds. So we're talking about the positive integers. And as a structure, we're talking about um, there's an initial positive integer. From every positive integer, we can go on to the next one. And um, that we have a relation of order. It's one positive integer preceding another in the generation of the positive integers. And that there uh, evident facts about this, if we think about them, if we formulate them at all, that that ordering relation is a linear ordering, it's a total ordering, that the initial uh, element one is least in that ordering, and that if m is less than n, then what immediately follows m is less than what immediately follows n. Now, then we may reflect on these ideas and start to be a little more sophisticated about these things and realize a meta principle such as that any definite property of the uh, positive integers which holds at some integer must hold at a least integer. And thinking about it, we see that, that that's true. It's a scheme 
not restricted to a language. It's an open-ended scheme. When I say it's a def, when we talk about definite properties here, <coughs> uh, some may obviously be definite, formulated in the language of uh, positive integers in the first order language, but others in the working experience of mathematicians will find that there are more and more properties that might be considered to which uh, we would apply this least number principle. And uh, so we might well consider uh, the question, is there a least n such that 2 to the l of n equals l of n plus 1? Uh, in a, taking the principle, least number principle, over to more elaborate uh, fields of mathematics. So I think uh, <coughs> I'll skip over the arguments here and just say that that kind of reflection leads us very quickly to a wealth of expression and interesting and challenging problems, certainly all of those ele of elementary number theory, and the recognition that uh, we may not be able to solve all those problems uh, by the tools of elementary number theory, but that uh, if you agree that we have a completely clear conception of the natural number structure or the positive integer structure, you ought to agree that every statement, um, uh, at least in the first order language of number theory, in which we can formulate all those statements is definite, is either true or false. So um, that I accept here Realism, realism in truth values and the application of classical reasoning as it applies to the natural numbers. I want to move on to quickly to the continuum because that's where the issue we're mainly concerned with here and point out that they're actually, although they're conflated in the talk about the continuum problem, that's simply because Different notions of the continuum are compared only with respect to cardinality in the case of set theory. I don't think we should include the geometrical continuum in the sense of Euclid under that because I don't think it's right to say that Euclid had a conception of the real line, uh, of the line, the straight line as, consist as equaling the set of all its points. Um, and that there's no sense that would, you would have in Euclidean geometry of deleting a point from a line, which makes sense, of course, perfectly in modern conceptions of geometry, uh, as Hilbert, who added the axiom of uh, continuity uh, of, of Dedekind style to Euclidean axioms, Euclidean style axioms. So um, then the real line, is a, is a kind of a hybrid conception. We have our geometric part and we have our arithmetic part and somehow we put those together. And that's the, one of the most important structures that we deal with in mathematics. It's ubiquitous all over. The set theoretical continuum is separate from that. It's simply this pure idea of either all sequences of zeros and ones or all subsets of the natural numbers. I don't include physical conceptions of the continuum since for mathematicians, our only way of expressing them uh, is via uh, one of the conceptions via geometry or the real numbers. So when we're talking about the continuum hypothesis, um, which is it about? To say that all of these are just aspects of the same cardinal number actually assumes, the proof of that actually assumes a certain amount of set theory, a little bit of impredicate of set theory. But as far as set theory is concerned, it erases a conceptual distinction between all of these, and in particular, the distinction between sets and sequences. What are sets supposed to be? They're supposed to be definite totalities determined solely by which objects and the membership relation to them. And what is a definite totality? It's one such that you, it's completely determined which things belong to it and which don't. And that's the same as saying, uh, that the operation of quantification over it with respect to definite properties has a determinate truth value. Uh, in order to have a determinate truth value, you'd have to know exactly which things belong and which things don't. Now, supposedly, in higher set theory, or 
not even that high set theory. We're talking about the universe of all sets. But by Russell's paradox, that's not a definite totality. If it were, it would be a set, and then we could talk about the set of all sets which don't belong to themselves. So it's not a definite totality. In some sense, it's essentially indefinite. Um, now, you might say, and here is where things start to get at issue, even accepting what we're talking about in set theory are sets as definite totalities. Quantification over the elements of a set is a definite uh, logical operation. That doesn't tell us that the power set operation is a definite operation which leads from sets to sets. But um, if you accept what we're saying here, if we're only going to quantify over definite totalities, we're only going to have restricted quantification in a set theory, not unrestricted quantification over V. And that immediately knocks us down to what's called it KP omega, Kripke Platek, with the axiom of infinity or admissible uh, set theory. At most, uh, we would be justified in adding to that the power axiom and the axiom of choice. And classical logic only for bounded statements. But uh, coming back to what is at issue philosophically, the assumption here of the power set of the natural numbers, the power set of the power set of the natural numbers as definite totalities, I don't see how it's justified philosophically, except on Platonistic grounds, that these sets that we're talking about are independent of human thoughts and construction. And to try to make that idea of uh, arbitrary set definite, you want to say, well, these are the sets that satisfy such and such conditions. But every attempt to say what that is, for example, by talking about constructible sets, violates the idea of what it means to be arbitrary. Well, let's look particularly at the power set of n and its alternative, 2 to the n. I think it's very intuitive what 2 to the n is. Arbitrary sequences of zeros of 1, it's thought of as a tree, as opposed to the power set of n, the totality of subsets of n, scattering of uh, uh, elements among the uh, natural numbers. But to formulate the continuum hypothesis as a definite uh, statement, you need to have not only the power set of n, but the double power set of n. And now here's the proposal to look at this thing uh, from a logical point of view. That one way of saying that things are definite is that we're allowed to apply the law of excluded middle. That when we're faced with a situation where they're indefinite, we would not be allowed to apply the law of excluded middle. That is, we would restrict ourselves to logic without the law of excluded middle, which is just intuitionistic logic. Now, that doesn't mean we go the, the whole road with intuitionists, but just that distinction as to whether we accept the law of excluded middle or not. Um, so that would mean that um, if we're going to follow this up from a logical point of view, we would accept classical logic for bounded quantification, use intuitionistic logic for unbounded quantification. And the idea is, with various theories, we might be interested in then seeing, well, most work that we've been doing as set theorists, the, the meta-mathematics of set theory, has been assuming classical logic for the whole system. But we might as soon look at the associated system where the logic is mixed. We assume only classical logic for bounded statements. So that's semi-intuitionistic. And But it turns out we can beef up the system so let's look at uh, classical system of admissible set theory. 
The semi-intuitionistic system used the law of excluded middle only for bounded four north, uh, delta zero law of excluded middle. Uh, it's useful to add something considered in the intuitionistic literature, a, a form of what's called Markov's principle. But then we can beef it up to what I call a semi-constructive system that uh, instead of just using the sigma one axiom of choice or sigma one collection axiom, we have the full axiom of choice. That's the associated semi-constructive system. We have the usual formulations of power. And there's a meta theorem that says that it doesn't make any difference in these various systems, whether you consider them classically or in the semi-constructive versions or semi-intuitionistic versions. So now we can pose a, form, a definite logical problem. A statement is formally definite if you can prove in one of these semi-constructive systems phi or not phi. You want to know, is a continual hypothesis definite? If you assume the power set of the power set of n, and hence if you assume power, it's certainly definite. But if you just assume the power set of n or the power set of omega, my conjecture is it's not formally definite there. But I don't know how to prove that. And so I think that's an interesting beginning question if we say what's definite, what's not, let's try to tackle that and get some information about how the continuum hypothesis looks. Now, accepting the view that you shouldn't quantify with cl using classical logic over arbitrary sets, but only, only sets which are definite totalities. That's only an initial criterion of definiteness. Proving that, solving that problem, proving that it's not definite in that particular system would, I think, be an interesting start. But I hope that this is just a start and that we could have more uh, further refined notions of definiteness that would throw light besides these philosophical considerations, besides these circumstantial considerations on whether or not the continuum hypothesis is a definite statement. Thank you, and thank you for, for your patience. Can you go back to the slide where you were talking about John Scale? Which slide? Oh, John Sir. Good. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. So, are, are you suggesting that? Uh, I have a hearing problem, so maybe Peter can. Uh, Hello, can you hear me now? Oh. Hello? Hello. Yeah. <laughs> so are, are you saying that, uh, are, are you agreeing with him uh, about, he says uh, many facts regarding these things are objective facts in the sense that they're not matter of our preference evaluation or moral attitudes. So are you saying that you agree with him that these so-called facts about money, property, et cetera, are similar to facts about numbers? Um. The reason I ask this question is when you gave the example of Rafael Nadal playing, you know, winning the US Open. So first of all, I agree with what Searle says here. Social reality is ubiquitous, it's invisible, because it surrounds our lives totally. That's correct. However, um, <laughs> however, so now whether mathematics mm -hmm. is to be considered part of social reality or has to do with some 
objective reality like supposedly physics or chemistry, biology, has to do with some objective reality independent of human conceptions. That's another issue, right? And my argument is mathematics is more like this kind than like those kind. The natural yeah, I, I, I disagree with you because there is the issue of verifiability. So when you, when you say that you know that Rafael Nadal won the US Open, you watched it on your TV screen, you don't know that. You just know. How do I know that? How do you know? Yeah, exactly. Yes. It has to do with verifiability. So if you, if you, if you take into account the issue of verifiability. That's <laughs> um, then, the, then, then if these you start to ask questions like that, your social world, which, as I say, surrounds you totally, falls apart. True. Because everything becomes at issue. Everything has to be taken to a court. But then the court itself has to be taken to a court. True, There's true. no end to that. Correct. Uh, However, there is a difference. I think you have to recognize the difference. Yes. Even so, even though what you say is true, there is a difference between what what are facts that you list on your next slide, and what are facts? Um, right. What so is we're fact? We're talking about now. Gal, should we compare that with there are infinitely many prime numbers? Yes, I think I think there is still a difference. <laughs> uh, well, I like you to, I like the audience to really take that uh, into consideration. Obviously, it's not the same kind of fact, but I say it has the same source in human conception. Our conception of what a tennis game is, or what a chess game is, or what a theorem in mathematics is about the natural numbers, are there are obviously un conceptions that are not like each other, uh, but they are in certain senses like each other because they have rather clearly defined rules uh, as to what constitutes a, a, a tennis match, what constitutes a, T to me it a boils chess match, and so on, and what constitutes a proof. In I, I would just add one last line here. Yes. To me, it boils down to the effort it requires to verify something. I, I'm not getting so. So to me, if I'm not being responsive, it's because I, as I said, I have a hearing problem. So maybe. Okay. Okay. Hi. Uh, I want to, uh, in a way, talk along the lines of your lecture. Uh, even concepts like the natural numbers, z one, two, three, add zero to it, and so on. I think are dependent, are of course extremely important, but are really dependent on, on the physical and social world we are living in. Yes. So we have uh, these numbers, and we can say that in the audience, let's say there are 45 or whatever, 55 people. But if you imagine some sort of a continuous world, where you have intelligent uh, beings, but they are not really distinct from each other. And that continuous world doesn't have points. It only has sets and containment amongst sets, overlapping of sets, and so on, but no single points. Then, uh, and maybe some physical laws which are completely different from those of the world we live in. In that world, I think natural numbers would not arise. And uh, No argument. Okay, <laughs> that's what I said, yeah. that it's really along your lines. Now I have a question, maybe two, if, but very brief, very okay. brief. Uh, you accept in our world the totality of all integers, infinite mm. set of integers, you accept that as a valid and sort of 
obvious concept. And let me add quickly the second question. So mathematics is enormously important. And not just discrete mathematics of the kind that we lowly computer scientists are engaged in. Don't say lowly. Uh, okay, <laughs> not only that, uh, but of course continuous mathematics. You prove you have calculus, you prove theorems in the calculus, you apply them to the real world. Now, uh, so as I said, first question is do you accept the totality of integers as an object? Second question, completely unrelated, are there examples where these uh, more, maybe perhaps even arcane assumptions about cardinals, super infinite cardinals and so on, have an impact? The axiom of choice you said does have an impact mm. on actual mathematics. Are there examples where these other axioms would make a difference in the mathematics, the analysis which is then applied to cosmology, quantum mechanics, mm -hmm. uh, electricity, and so on, all the things which are really very, very useful and mm -hmm. uh, you know, shape our lives? So, good question. So, first of all, uh, the first question, I don't say the totality of the natural numbers exists, but that the, co to the conception of the totality of the natural numbers is a definite concept. So people say, well, why isn't it, say, the non-standard integers? And I say, if you understand the concept of non-standard integer, you already understand the concept of standard integer. That, that's a uh, distinction, yes. yes. Um, as to the second, that's a quite good question. And uh, in various articles, I've, I've argued that there's considerable evidence that uh, all of scientifically applicable mathematics can be developed in a formal system which happens to be conservative over piano arithmetic. This has to use detailed checking to see whether this theorem from functional analysis, that theorem from probability theory, et cetera, et cetera, can be formulated in that theory that I'm talking about. But there is a lot of evidence of that kind, some of which uh, I carried out, a lot of which uh, is due to Friedman and Simpson in their reverse mathematics program, in which they show that, uh, that uh, the kind of mathematics that's needed for scientifically, uh, scientific applications actually is very little of what comes from set theory. Even if you assume the axiom of choice, once you go down to L and go down even further, you can make so it. So why bother about the continuum hypothesis, except for getting tenure? If you're going to think about sets at all and, you know, put, put ourselves back at, uh, in Cantor's time, the ideas were very radical. But once people started to understand them and say, yeah, I understand what it means to be a cardinal number, I understand what it means to be an ordinal number, these principles seem very reasonable, and there's a connection between them through the axiom of choice, which seems reasonable under this concept of arbitrary set. Then, what is, which aleph is the power of the continuum? <laughs> uh, first obvious question. Uh, so, I don't care. <laughs> I personally don't care except as a, as a philosophical issue and a logical issue. I'm gonna steal a question. Whoops, is this on? Oh, okay. Um, so I have, first comments, two, two issues with your expert in set theory. First, the expert in set theory makes- Maybe they chose the wrong expert. <laughs> I think they did, um, for two reasons. That, that expert makes a mathematical mistake the omega conjecture is a conjecture of ZFC. Pardon? The omega conjecture is a conjecture of ZFC. It's a conjecture of ZFC. It doesn't have anything, any logical consequences for the size of the continuum. Uh, as Rather, I it's that if the omega conjecture is true, 
then there's a cluster of theorems which make a case for the failure of CH, and there's another cluster of theorems which make a case for the continuum being Aleph 2. But the Omega conjecture does not have any implications. I understand, um, or at least I think I understand. The literature is so complicated. Um, but um, maybe by implying it seems that to prove implied. the Omega conjecture, you'd have to assume uh, something at least like infinitely many wooden cardinals or a No, it's a conjecture of CFC. Okay. So you just sit down and start generating theorems it's from It's a statement. CFC. It's currently a statement in ZFC. I understand that. I know, but it's a conjecture in ZFC as well. It's a conjecture that ZFC proves the Omega conjecture? Yes. Uh, okay. And then the second issue with the expert and set theory is, personally, I'm well, agnostic. Did, did I misunderstand your 2010 article in the Girdle volume? That yeah. large cardinal axioms are not enough. Something more has to be done. In order to settle the, the problem of the continuum. Yeah, that just says that large cardinal axioms do not settle the problem of the continuum. Yes. And the omega conjecture, a conjectured theorem of ZFC, plays a role, a key role, in a large argument that would go for the conclusion that CH fails. And that large argument does not proceed just on the basis of. Uh, the omega conjecture and its logical consequences. So you're, uh, let me see if I understand you properly. Are you saying it might be that the omega conjecture, or the strong omega conjecture, as a statement in ZFC might be proved, assuming what? In ZFC. Proved in it's ZFC. It's a conjecture of ZFC. And then ZFC would prove that 2 to the L of 0 equals L of 2? No, of course not. It can't. What would it prove then? who prove the omega conjecture, and then the omega conjecture would figure in the argument that I and other people have given for the continuum hypothesis being false. And what would you need for that? Well, you look at that argument, and then, look, it, I'm just so making a mathematical point. The mathematical <laughs> point is that it's a conjecture of ZFC, and it has never been conjectured that the omega conjecture implies the failure of CH. That's the first point. The second point about the expert and set theory is Personally, I'm agnostic on the question of whether CH is determinate or not. But that aside, even if I believed that CH is determinate, even if I was the staunchest realist in set theory, I would never dream of making the case that it should be put on the millennium list. And the reason is that the task of proving CH or settling CH is an indefinite task, simply because we know that it's going to be tied up with the justification of new axioms. That alone is sufficient to not get it on the list. But that doesn't touch the question of whether it is or act as circumstantial evidence for the claim that it is an indefinite statement. The task so is an indefinite task, but we have to contemplate what would happen if that indefinite task is somehow completed. Does it become definite then, or is it still up no. in the air yeah, I think, I think that it's going to be a difficult case. So uh, there could be a statement in number theory which has the same features. So um, if you were sitting on the scientific advisory board of the Millennium Prize list, would you add CH given this? No, and I wouldn't add a simple number theoretic statement if it was known to be independent of large cardinals and if it was thought that in order to settle that simple number theoretic statement, you would have to go beyond axioms that are implicitly accepted by the community now. I would want to make sure that the problem is very low down, likely to be provable or refutable in PA, yeah. so that when a controversy arose, it would be easy to settle the question whether the task had been implemented. But well, that we doesn't didn't mean that the question is They indefinite. didn't know in the case of Fermat, which was already done by the time the list uh, came into existence, whether it was going to be provable or not provable in PA, uh, and we still don't know. But uh, the point is that we, no one would have conjectured that it was completely independent, and with CH, we know that it's completely independent of large cardinals. Yeah. Um, I think we're going round and round. I'm going to have to study your what, what you're saying more closely.
So while I was listening to you. Um, Excuse me, I'd like to get oh. some water. Please do. Uh, while I was listening to you describe, um, uh, dare I call it your epistemology, um, uh, I was thinking to myself, this sounds a lot like um, how I read Brower when he's explaining his epistemology. Um, and then I was sort of uh, tickled to notice that you then move on to say, and so indeed if we want to sort of formalize these notions, uh, we, we need to add a, an intuitionistic component to our formalism as well. And I was wondering whether or not you, you feel like you, you followed a, a similar, obviously Brower was very um, aggressive in, 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 in his philosophy, but um, whether, whether, whether you sort of followed a, a similar line of uh, thinking and saying, well, this is how I want to view the problem, and, and so I will go to intuitionism as a, as a formal tool, mm -hmm. or whether it just kind of, it was a natural progression. Um, well, certainly there's an overlap with ideas from Brouwer, uh, who saw the source of mathematics in human conceptions. But um, we already differ on, in the case of the natural numbers, where he refuses to accept classical logic as applied to statements involving quantification over the natural numbers. Um, and why do I differ with him on that? Um, well, you know that Brower takes this kind of position that people in what um, other branches of philosophy, philosophy of science, verificationist, that something is true only if it can be verified. But our ordinary concept of true does not add that demand that it's true only if it can be verified. We want to find out if things are true, and we try to find out, we try to demonstrate they're true by a verification, which in the case of mathematics is a proof. But to insist that we were only going to consider the questions of truth with respect to whether we can verify them or not, that's putting the cart before the horse, it seems to me. So it seems to me we should consider these things independently. We talk about ideas of truth, talk about ideas of proof, do not assume that they coincide, and then see which things uh, can or cannot be true. So what I'm trying to address here uh, is whether we have a coherent concept of truth which is applicable in particular to the continuum problem. And the first thought experiment said, well, let's try to see what a proof would look like. Would any mathematician recognize that as a proof because it w makes use of such extraordinarily unusual hypotheses that it's beyond the bounds of ordinary mathematical experience? But that certainly, as I said, does not demonstrate that the continuum problem is not a definite problem. So that's why I feel we have to go into philosophical territory to, to do that. But I want to keep truth and proof separate. All right, thank you. So you wanted to, you said that you wanted to keep truth and verification separate. Yes. However, the way you defined definiteness was in terms of what traditionally we would consider a proof system. So classical logic with bounded quantification or intuitionistic with unbounded. Yes. So are you not contradicting yourself? As to a minute ago. You know, not everything has a total foundation in nothing. So 
I'm a presuming certain ideas here, ideas about truth, about definiteness, and so on, which I think are common currency. But I c and at the very end, I try to say there is a little bit of logic where we could make actual distinction and establish the difference between definiteness and indefiniteness. We could formulate very precise problems in that way. Very definite problems about what's definite and what's not definite. But that's not what my argument is based on. I'm trying to say that <laughs> we have some ideas about definiteness and indefiniteness that uh, we have to have to take as a starting point. This is not the same as being vague. So the presidential line of succession, it seems to me, is a perfectly clear idea, but it's indefinite. Who is number 18 in the, in the line of succession? <laughs> it's not determined. <laughs>